talking about a story um, that I think, I, I, well, I shouldn't say I think. I know I have. Of course, I don't recall when, but I did cover, I have covered this particular um, passage of, of sermon, uh, passage of Scripture before in times past, and I think it was, I don't remember the last time. It could have been years ago, but um, we're going to revisit again today, but I, I desire to shed new light on it, or as always, and let you begin to see it in a new way. Amen? Um, so we're going to look beyond that what you see, and and the way I have it planned out today, um, it's going to I'm going to do my, the message is going to be a little bit different. So um, I think you're going to it'll be much like last time. So you're going to have to pay attention um, because all the components are going to add up at the end, right? So just kind of pay attention as we go through it. Uh, I'm going to start off with some foundational scriptures, and then we're going to get into the main story, the main message of it. So. Uh, today's message is called the Roaring Lion. The Roaring Lion. And let's look, uh, as we speak about Roaring Lions, and as we talk about lions in particular, I'm just gonna I've just uh, kind of selected a few scriptures that kind of speak of lions. So, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 6 is the first one, and we have several listed here. It says, Therefore a lion from the forest will slay them. A wolf of the deserts will destroy them. A leopard is watching their cities. Everyone who goes out of them will be torn in pieces. Because their transgressions are many, their apostasies are numerous. First Kings 20 and 36 says, Then he said to him, Because you have not listened to the voice of Yahweh, behold, as soon as you have departed from me, a lion will kill you. And as soon as he had departed from him, a lion found him and killed him. And he, Mark 1 and 13, And he said he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. As we look at these scriptures on today, we're going to be looking at them in the context of Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, as many of you know, this is the story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and... Uh, no, excuse me, no, that's, that's a whole other one. I did... I was thinking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in my mind. I was reading it earlier. But this is the story of Daniel and the lion's den. So I know if any of you are familiar with this. And we're going to kind of read through it. But I hope to bring uh, you know, new revelation to it to you on today. Um, let's just go to the scriptures and then we're going to go back. It says, verse 3, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, and so what it had, well let me take it back because I missed the scripture here, not purposefully. Um, they had, could not find any uh, uh, guilt in him except for with his God. And so what they decided to do is they got together and they kind of tricked the king and they said, hey, listen, let it be known amongst the territories that for 30 days that no one is going to pray or offer up prayer or petitions uh, to any god of any kind in all the land except for you, O king. And I think the king, um, the feeling I get from this is the king was like, yeah, yeah, fine, okay, whatever. I got, you know, and he's on about his business. He's got stuff to do. He's not really uh, thinking about it too heavily. And I, I'll tell you why, and I, I believe that in a moment. But so he, he goes ahead and you know how it is. I mean, you know, kings and presidents and stuff, they get a lot of stuff thrown on their desk and they just kind of rubber stamp some things, you know. And I think that's kind of what happened here. So he, he rubber stamps it. And, and as he rubber stamps this, it moves forth. And so for 30 days, that no one is allowed to, to, to openly pray except for um, to the, you know, to the uh, petition of the king and prayer to the king. So the king stamped it. He signed it. And here we are again now, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that this document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber he had windows open towards Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Now one thing I want you to notice here, uh, we're going to go back through these scriptures in a moment, but one thing I want you to notice is that the edict was signed. The law was set in place. And the law stipulated that if any man was found praying 
to another to a god of any kind and not praying to the king or not you know uh, petitioning the king in a matter then he would be put to death daniel knew the document was signed he had foreknowledge of this and he basically said listen i'm not going to stop praying to my god even if it means my death in other words, I'm not going to allow you to separate me from my God. And now he didn't even close the windows to his room. See, he could have done that, right? I mean, I think most of us would have probably said, listen, I might not, I'm not going to stop praying, but I, you know, it's probably prudent to close the windows. But he said, no, man, I believe the windows open. I am not ashamed of my God. I'm not ashamed of prayer. I'm not ashamed of coming before him. And I'm, not, I'm going to let my light shine. I'm not going to close it in. So he continued praying. And continued seeking a relationship and pressing in on his relationship with God. Then in verse 12, they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that a man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, this, this, this statement is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. And they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Verse 16, Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet ring of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn, verse 19, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, and as much as I was found innocent before him and also towards you. O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now, I want to take you back through some of these scriptures again and share with you Daniel chapter 3, or excuse me, Daniel verse 3. I want you to take note of some of these things. Daniel began to distinguish himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. One of the things I want you to take notice in this verse is he, he possessed an extraordinary spirit. The spirit that he possessed was the spirit of the living God and that spirit of the living God distinguishes him from the other people. Now you have to remember back then in, in the time, this is before Pentecost, right? This is before the time of Christ in the book of Acts chapter 2 in which Pentecost came and the Spirit of God was delivered and poured out forth on all mankind. So only select individuals who God had predestined and preappointed to receive His Spirit would receive His Spirit in part measure. So Daniel was blessed and he had the ability to interpret dreams and, and he had, why, had a, a gift of wisdom and he distinguished himself from uh, the rest of the... Uh, the governors and the satraps and the counselors and the, and the other wise men. He distinguished himself because even as noted here, he had an extraordinary spirit and that spirit was the spirit of the living God. Now, the king in this particular context, I believe as we begin to look at the king, you know, when you think about the king, obviously the king makes a mistake and we're going to see that by rubber stamping that deal, right? By signing off on it. We also see that, you know, and, and that, that wasn't wise and it wasn't prudent. 
But it helps in this context if we begin to think of the king uh, in, in, in a manner of speaking. Obviously, we're not equating this, but there is a correlation here that the king is very much like Christ. If you think of him in the context of Christ in this particular uh, passage, it will help you. And now, again, I'm not equating the king to Christ because obviously the king made a mistake and Christ is perfect. But it will help you to think this way. They, the, the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in much as he was faithful and no negligence corruption was to be found in him. In other words, they were trying to pin him with something. They were trying to dig in his business. They were trying to, you know, they hired private investigators and they were looking at his Facebook page and they were, you know, they were going after him and they were trying to figure out, man, this dude has done some stuff and he's obviously, you know, there's dirt on everybody. Everybody's got bones in their closet, right? And, and so something, you know, we've got to come up with something and something that he's doing wrong so that we can accuse him because he's distinguishing himself and he's going to put us out of business because the, the, the king is listening to him and he's not going to listen to us and we're not going to get the things we want which are you know, money and wealth and, and, and territory and all these other things that they desire because they are of the world. They are of the world's government. And, da and Daniel is not of the world's government. Daniel is of God's government. He's distinguished. He's separate. He's like we are called, a peculiar people. We're strange. We are priests. We are, we're a holy nation, a chosen race. I mean, we're different from the rest of the world. The Bible says so. When we belong to Christ as His children, we're different. We're distinguished. And we have an extra, ordinary spirit, just like Daniel did. And the world doesn't like that. And Christ told us that the world would hate us as a result of that. They would hate us because they won't understand us. They can't understand us because they refuse to repent of their sin. And their sin blinds them and keeps them separated from God. So these men said, We will not find any grounds of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So in other words, there's no way to get at him because he's not doing anything wrong. So the only thing that we can come against him with is with his faith. Now, doesn't that sound like the world? See, they can't say, they can't yell at, they can't yell at us for being liars. They can't yell at us for, uh, for stealing. They can't yell at us for murdering. They can't yell at us because uh, we want to save the babies. We can't, they can't yell at us because, you know, all the things that we obey, because, you know, we're, the things we do are good in all men's sight. Right? So the only accusation that they can come against us with is with our faith, and, and through political correctness and, and, and uh, on these other fronts uh, that they are, they are attacking us with, uh, such as uh, saying, you know, that, uh, trying to, uh, uh, saying that we have hate speech because we speak against those things which are unpleasing to God. But we make it very clear that while we hate sin, we don't hate the sinner. Just as God said that we should. He says we are to abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. So we don't like the things that are evil, but we don't want to kill the things that are evil. Unlike Muslims, right? They believe Jews and Christians are evil and the worst. And so what do they want to do? Kill them. Destroy them. And they have precedent uh, to do so from their God with a little g. Command to do so. But these people in Daniel, they could find nothing against him, so they attacked him with his faith. Now, I want you to remember as well that Daniel, the king, uh, the king here, desired to put Daniel over the kingdom. He desired to give him the kingdom. He planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom, verse 3. What does Christ want to do for us? He wants to appoint us over parts of the kingdom according to the fruit that we bear. So according to that which we invest and to that which we sow, it determines that which we'll reap in the kingdom to come. So what we do here affects our uh, eternity, especially in the kingdom to come. So we know that we're, what we do here, we can't just go along to get along and think we're, because we're, we're saved that all of a sudden that we're going to get into heaven and we're going to uh, uh, you know, float on clouds and play the harp all day. The Bible says nothing of the sort. Not in it. 
The scripture explicitly tells us that, in the, that what we do here is going to determine what we do there. That the measure of faith that we have here in, in operation and in action and the amount of fruit that we bear while we're here will determine our position in the kingdom of God that is to come. So this king, much like Christ in this context, wanted to appoint Daniel over the entire kingdom and the world was coming against him and they were trying to take him out and they couldn't take him out because of his sin because they found no sin. So the only thing they could take him out with was to attack his faith. Remember, sin separates you from God. So the Bible tells us Whosoever breaketh the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So when you sin, in other words, you open the door. And the Bible says when you sin and you open the door, you give the enemy room that he might come in and consume you. So they could find no opening. You following me? They could find no opening here. So they, again, the only thing they could do was shake his faith. Try to attack his faith. That's the, same, the devil's up to the same old tricks today. Moving on to verse 10. This is after they had already set the, the edict in place that he's not allowed to worship or pray. Now, when the document was signed, he entered the house. We talked about this already. He began to pray. He wasn't ashamed. He wasn't embarrassed. He let the whole world see he's praying. He's bowing down before his God, and he will bow down before no other. They came in agreement. The last part of the scripture, verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. They came in agreement. So that's important to recognize. That means they had a purpose, they had an agenda, that they had agreed together to come together to try to take him out, and they were planning on taking him out by attacking him via his faith. They came together in agreement. We know, the Bible says, that in the end days, an agreement will be made. That whosoever does not take the mark of the beast shall be put to death, and he will not be able to buy, nor will he be able to sell. An agreement will be made, and that agreement attacks what? Your faith. It's not that you're guilty of sin, or you're guilty of stealing, or murdering, or, or doing horrible things. It's an attack on your faith. It's interesting how they attacked his faith, but they didn't attack any else's faith. They weren't interested. They didn't care if the guy around the corner was praying to Allah, or they didn't care if the 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 the, the, the sorcerer was you know um, casting spells and you know and, and, and killing children. They they didn't care about all that. They didn't care if they were you know um, Roman Catholic and and, and, and worshiping uh, Mary you know as it's uh, in the catechism. They weren't. They didn't care about those things. All they cared about was taking out the man of God. You know, I was thinking about that, and it made me, I was trying to remember back when, and I'm not sure if I can remember the date. I think it was in 2006 or 2008. I, I don't know. Um, but it, there was a, a celebration in which they, they held, and I think they held it at the, um, it might have been in, in it, it was in Italy. It might have been either at, at uh, Assisi or at the Vatican. Uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not recalling, but there was over 300 300 uh, people that were present uh, that the, the Pope had invited to come uh, in order uh, to uh, pray for peace uh, in the Vatican. And I think it was in the Vatican. And, and they had asked them all to come there, and they had, they had Hindus there, they had Buddhists there, they had uh, Muslims there, they had um, African witch doctors, American uh, shamans there. They had, um, I mean, uh, Jainists. Uh, they had uh, uh, Shintoists were there. They had people from all faiths and all religions all over the world, and they were all present, and they were all invited, and they all came, and, 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 they, and they prayed together. And they, matter of fact, they even took the Buddha statue and placed it on the altar of Christ in the Vatican, and the Shintoists uh, began chanting and, and, and do that, and the, the uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, shamanists, uh, began to uh, do, you know, do the, their, uh, their chanting along with their smoke and the, the pipe, and all, I mean, everything was going on, right? And they all did this right there in the Vatican, but guess who was not there? No Protestants, no Christians. Everybody else was invited but the Christians. 
See, the devil's up to the same thing. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care what religion you are as long as you're not on the side of God Almighty. As long as you're not for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have a Savior that has redeemed you, set you free, and empowered you with true power from on high as opposed to conjured power from on low, from the darkness, natural, demonic power, the Scripture calls it. Verse 12, we go on to look at this. They, they, this is where they say, ah, oh, we got him in something. He broke the law that we put in place in order to trap him. It worked. It worked. We're going to get him. So he brings it up before the king. King, hey, didn't you sign uh, something saying they couldn't pray? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. Daniel did. He broke it, he broke it. Kill him, kill him, kill him. And the king's upset by this. He's dismayed by this. Verse 14 says, As soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. Even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. So as soon as he found out that this was a trap, as soon as he found out that he had really messed up by signing this document and that Daniel, whom he loved, was in jeopardy, Daniel, whom he had desired to place over the kingdom, was in jeopardy, he was distressed about it so much so that he, he wasn't sleeping. He kept thinking about this all night. How can I set him free? How can I make amends? How can I ratify the agreement that I made? Is is there anything legally that I can do here? Or am I, uh, am I out of luck? Is Daniel out of luck? Uh, what, what's to take place? He wanted to rescue him. He made a mistake in, in, in signing that document. I think we, he sees that here and he's distressed by it. And as a result, it placed Daniel, whom he loved, in great jeopardy, even under threat of death. And the enemy was attacking him, and he was trying to figure out how he could save him. I think this is, this is a strong correlation to the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Knowledge. When they ate of the Tree of Knowledge, both Adam and Eve, and they were kicked out of the garden. The enemy now had access to them, and now God, being distressed, how can he save them? How can he set them free? How can he deliver them? How can he rescue the humanity? And he said to the woman, because you've done this thing, that I'm going to set an enmity between you and the serpent, and you shall step upon the serpent, and you shall uh, bruise his, or he shall bruise your heel, and and you're going to destroy him ultimately, and, and that was through Christ as the Son, as the first prophetic reference to Christ coming in the Garden of Eden. So Daniel, a king in this context, is thinking the same way. How can I set free that whom I love because of the false accusation in this condition that he's guilty of breaking a worldly law that I put in place? So the gate, this is where it becomes interesting. In verse 16, when he goes into the lion's den, the king gave the order, and Daniel was brought there, and he was cast into the lion's den. Now, you have to understand something about the lion's den. There was normally uh, several lions that were in there, normally one male and several females, or, nor, or it was all females, and the lions were normally uh, uh, starved. They were normally very hungry, so they would be vicious, and, and so they would be, you know, so as soon as somebody was thrown in there, they were uh, pretty much just destroyed immediately. It wasn't like they, they didn't bat with them and play with them and you know they weren't at the zoo. So you don't think about it, it as like a zoo lion and you went into the exhibit you know and, and you're hanging out with a lion that's been fed for the last you know. No, no, these lions were starving, right? And they were mistreated and abused and they typically hated people and because of that abuse and, and uh, as soon as you threw them in they were devoured, ripped to pieces. So the king speaking here he spoke and said to Daniel, see this is where the king demonstrates his faith and demonstrates the fact that he believed in Daniel's God. He says, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. How, how, why does he come to that conclusion? Why did he come to that place? Is he just trying to say, I mean, you know, a lot of kings, if you look in the Old Testament, and even if you look today, he says, well, man, I'm sorry I messed up, too bad, chunk you in there and it's over. He was so distressed about it that he stayed up all night figuring a way to rescue him. I believe God spoke to him in some way, shape, or form and told, gave him some peace about it. 
And so now he receives his peace and he speaks out to him and says, God is going to save you. He himself will deliver you. So they put the stone there and they put the, the stamps with the, the, the wax and the seals over it so that no one could say that it was altered and so that no one could say that it was broken. Much like when they put the stone in front of Christ. Tomb. Now I want you to take note. He spent, the king went off into his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fed, fled from him. So he, what did he do? He was fasting and praying. Fasting and interceding. In other words, he was standing in agreement not with those who were the accusers, but he's standing in agreement with God and he's standing in agreement with Daniel and he's praying and interceding and not eating and, he, and he's, he, he's petitioning God that God would deliver him and set him free. Then in verse 19, the king gets up early in the morning, right? He arose at the break of dawn, first light, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice, and he said, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also towards you, I have committed no crime. The king was pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be released from the den. And Daniel, there was no injury found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now, now, why, why am I, why, I, I'm hoping you're getting something from it, but I want to kind of bring it to a greater light. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Let's go back. Let's go back. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 5. We're going to look at those scriptures that I, I had referenced to you before. Therefore, a lion for the forest will slay them, a wolf in the desert will destroy them, a leopard is watching the city one, everyone who goes out of them will torn to pieces, because their transgressions are many, their apostasies are numerous. So, because their apostasies are numerous, because they, they are, uh, uh, are, are operating in error, because they are living in sin and they're not repenting, because they are transgressing and they're aggressing or breaking God's law, God is going to allow the lion to destroy them, the lions to devour them. The lions to devour them. He will slay them. First Kings 20, 36, Then he said, Because you have not listened to the voice of Yahweh, behold, as soon as you have departed from me, a lion will kill you. And as soon as he has departed from him, a lion found him and killed him. I want you to take note of this. A lion in the Scripture, as we see it in God's Word, has several implications. And one of the implications that we see as lions that are always used for God's purposes to enact His judgment upon people in the land of the living. Lions are often synonymous with demons. So God will use, sometimes use a natural lion with claws and paws and all that. Or other times he will use another term for the lion, which is a demon. They will go out and he will allow the demon to attack. He will allow the demon to, 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 to harm or to test. So another way of saying this is that we clearly see in the Scripture that God allows certain attacks and certain things to come upon mankind to test man that he might be found worthy. At other times, it's not a test. He allows the, the, the enemy to attack mankind or to attack man, not because he's so much allowing it to take place, but because you are or the person is allowing it to take place because they've broken the hedge of protection and they're not in relationship with Christ. They've separated themselves from God. Now the lions have access to them. Because of their transgression. Go again to the Jeremiah 5. A lion from the forest will slay them because their transgressions are many. Their apostasies are numerous. Kings 20 again. Because you have not listened to the voice of Yahweh, behold, as soon as you have departed from me, a lion will kill you. Because you have not listened. So the lions will attack as a result of this. Mark 1 and 13. Christ. Oh, catch this. Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by who? And he was with the wild beast. Another translation with us, he was with the lions. And the angels were ministering to him. So the lions, the demons, 
were tempting him, were tormenting him, along with Satan, but the ministering angels, the good angels, were ministering to him, helping him, assisting him, feeding him spiritually. All right, for, for last one, First Peter 5 eight. be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Seeking someone to devour. Now, can we go back to the lion's den? Daniel was threw into the lion's den. But the lions were not allowed to devour him because the Bible says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Why was he protected? Because no sin was found in him. He had not broken any transgressed the law. He had not done any wrong to God. God had set him apart. God had put his spirit upon him. He had the extraordinary spirit. He was distinguished. He was set apart. He belonged to God. He was not going to die and be consumed by the, by the lions. So God delivered him. And when he came back the next morning, there's you know, Daniel, and he snuggled up next to the lions, and he says, listen, it's all good, king. I'm still here. Everything's all right. God shut the mouths of the lion. Yes, they're hungry. Yes, they want to devour me. Yes, they would have killed anybody else. But God came in. He stepped in, and he shut their mouths because he found nothing, no sin in me. He wouldn't allow Satan to destroy me. He wouldn't allow the devil to overcome me. But he shut the lion's mouth. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. He stands before God day and night accusing man of sin. Christ comes in and he shut the lion's mouth. Somebody got it. Can I get an amen from that? Two or three people in the house. Christ, hold on, are you still with me? Christ went in to the lion's den in the desert. Forty days and forty nights he was with the lions in the lion's den. Is that what the scripture is got to saying? He was with the wild beasts for forty days and for forty nights. He was in the lion's den. But the angels came and ministered to him, strengthened him, and no sin was found in him. And so he left and he came out. Today, we are in the lion's den. Why? Because there are roaring lions seeking to devour us wherever we go, and they want to shut us down, they want to destroy us, they want to kill us, they want to, to, to eat us. But God does not want to allow them to. We remain in the lion's den even now. But like Daniel, we are being kept from being devoured, destroyed by our adversary because we're children of God. As children of God who have repented, who are born again, and who are blood washed, we are innocent in the sight of God. No sin remains. The enemy has no opportunity nor no room to destroy us, to devour us. We're innocent. Like Christ was innocent because Christ took our sin. Amen? Amen. Now, verse 24, the king then gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them, their children and their wives into the lion's den and they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. They brought the men who had maliciously did what? Accused. Accused Daniel. What's going to happen in Judgment Day, the eighth day? The, all, the one who is the accuser of the brethren, Satan, and all who are evil in the second judgment of mankind, all who uh, transgress God's law without repentance, all who have an antichrist spirit, all who, all, who are liars without repentance, all those who, who uh, uh, refuse to repent and, and are rebelled against God, they are going to be thrown into the lion's den, or into this case, the lake of fire. Just the same. Just as if, as the king did with the men who maliciously accused Daniel. He destroyed all of them. He left none of them alive so that evil would be completely destroyed altogether, the same as it will be on the eighth day. Then watch this. Then the king, Darius the king, verse 25, 
wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every tongue who are living in all the land, May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions, from the power of Satan, from the power of demons? Just as Christ has done for us. We're in the lion's den, but he's delivered us. He shut the lion's mouth and he set us free. They prowl around. They want to devour us. They're looking for an opening. They're looking for a space. They're looking for a way that they can get in to tear us up, to devour us. But as long as we remain blood washed, they can find no entry. They can't destroy us. They can't destroy us. And when I say destroy us, what I mean is this. I mean, you know, the, you know they, they may take our life, but they can't, can't take our eternal life. They can't take our spirit. The apostles were martyred. People today are being martyred for their faith. They're being shot. They're being tortured. They're being killed. They're being raped. They're being beheaded. All for their faith. You can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul. Our soul belongs to our Father. It's important here to look at it in this context. Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who what? Love God. Love God. Those who do what? Love God. Thank you. To those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. To be what? Conform, changed into the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. In other words, he glorified them, but he gave them power as well. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, come on. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all for us all how will he not also with him freely give us all things who will bring a charge against god's elect god is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns satan we know that messiah yeshua he who died yes rather who was raised who is at the right hand of god who also intercedes for us just as the king did for daniel who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, will those things separate us from the love of God? What can separate us? Sin. Our own sin without repentance can separate us. Only we can take or remove ourselves from the hand of God. See, there are those people who deceive themselves and delude themselves into thinking and believing that the Bible says they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You can put the white robes on. You can go to church every single Sunday. And, and, you can, and you can do all the things that are customary, all the traditions and all that, and think that you're saved, but you ain't any more saved than a rock. You're not saved. That doesn't make you saved whatsoever. The only thing that allows you to be saved is that you have a relationship with the living God. It's not that you read about Him in a book. It's not that you got down on your knees 15 times in one service. It's not that you, you know, uh, scream and shout. It's not any of those things. The only thing that saves you is that you have a relationship with the One who came to save you. That you know Him and that you love Him. What did that Scripture say? It's telling us right here. It says... Who can separate us from the love of Christ? From the what of Christ? Love. The love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But first you must love Christ. See, God set it forth. He sent His only begotten Son 
to the world that we might be saved, but we have to have a relationship with Him. Amen? We have to know Him, and we have to love Him, and we have to walk with Him, and we have to talk with Him. And when we are still in love with Him, here's what I want you to see as I'm coming to this. Even if you're thrown into a lion's den, which we really are, but even if we were literally thrown into the lion's den, should that stop you from loving God? No. Isn't that what the Scripture just says here? Well, tribulation, hard times. Anybody go through some hard times? Is that, should that separate? Are you going to stop loving God because you're going through hard times? Distress. How about persecution? I don't know about you, but when I'm persecuted, it makes me love God more. It, it heightens my zeal. Famine, nakedness, peril, or even if you die by the sword. Will that separate you from the love of God? No. You cannot that allow that to affect your relationship with Him. So it's the same way of saying, I mean, to me it's as absurd as saying, well, you know what? Because I got my, my truck stolen last week, uh, honey, I'm sorry, I, I just don't love you no more. Would I tell my wife I don't love her anymore because I'm having a bad day? Because I'm having a trouble? My enemy came and chopped off my arm. I don't love you. What sense does that make? What can separate us? We have to be in right relationship with God. We have to be in love with the king because we are the bride. We're the ones he's returning for. Do you think he's returning for, for a bride who doesn't love him? Do you think he's waited thousands of years so he can marry some just, you know, dull, grayed out kind of person that just doesn't even really care for him or want him or want to hold his hand? Yeah, I guess you can marry me if you want. I mean, you know, I mean, who wants a bride like that? No one. He wants one that has zeal for him, that loves him, that, that, had, that when they see him, the light in their eyes shine and their, their hands are red. They can't wait to marry him. They can't wait to put their arms around him. They can't wait to be with him forever. He's returning for his church, for the bride that loves him, that's without spot, blemish, wrinkle, or any such thing, the bride that is clothed in white robes that is without sin and has been made ready, that has kept herself. The Bible says true religion is this, to feed the widows, the orphans, the needy, etc., and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That means, I, I, you know, I'm not all stained and tattered and bruised up. I love God. God loves me. And no matter what comes against me, it's not going to change my relationship with Him. I'm going to love Him. Even if I'm throwing the dan uh, lion's den, I'm still going to love Him. If He shuts the lion's mouth, amen. If He doesn't shut the lion's mouth, I'm just going home. He's returning for the bride. He's returning for those who are hot for Him. Remember what He says in Revelations. He says, I wish that you were either hot for me or cold for me. That you were either on fire for me and you loved me and you had zeal for me. And you were, yeah, you're one of those people that raise your hands. Yes, you're one of those people that cry. Yes, you're one of those people that get on your knees. Yes, you're one of those people that open your mouth and sing to me. Yes, you're one of those people that, that will embrace me and want to live according to the way that I tell you you should live because you want to draw near to me. And as such, I'll draw near to you. That's called being on fire for God. Yeah, I want to be on fire for God because God says if I'm not on fire for Him, He's going to spit me out of His mouth. He'll vomit me out. He wants nothing to do with me. I wish that you were either hot for me or cold for me, but uh, that you're lukewarm. And as such, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That means you, you're distasteful to me. You're repugnant to me. That when you get into my stomach, it upset you. Upset my stomach. Christ went on to say, He says, Why? Why do you say that you love me? But then don't do the same things I tell you to do. By this you will know those who are my disciples by the love they have one for another. See, see the Bible is real clear. It's just most people are real ignorant. Most of us all were real ignorant. We were all formerly in darkness. Amen? We came to the light of life. We came to the light of Christ. We came to a place where we know the differentiation between right and wrong and we received light which is the knowledge of the Creator that we might walk in His light and His light may be a lamp unto our feet and illuminate the path before us so that we know which way to go. Narrow is the way and there are few who will find it. So to, in order for us to be into the lines, then like Daniel, we have to maintain our love for him and not let our love for him wane or detract. Listen to verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Yeshua, Messiah, our King. Nothing can separate us from His love. Only us. We are held in His hand. We're held in His hand and nothing can rip us out. He holds our spirits, our souls in His hand and nothing can take us out. We are written on the palm of the King of Kings. Amen. We are written in His hand. Our names are written in the, la the, the Bible calls the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Our names are written there. So even if the, the roaring lion for somehow or another is allowed to devour us or to destroy us, we will live. We're okay. It's going to be all right. Speaking about lions and, and him being thrown into the lion's den and how we are in that lion's den now and God's keeping the devourer from destroying our spirit and our soul and he holds it in his hand. You know, when I was thinking on this, I said, well, yeah, but isn't the Bible also referred to Christ as the Lamb? That he came as a lamb, but he's returning as the lion of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the conquering lion, the king of all the lions. You know, I, I thought about that, and, and you know what, I've come, I come to this conclusion that there's all these young, the Bible calls them actually young lions. Young lions that go out, and these young lions that God, you see, it's not that they have power, in, uh, it's not that they have authority, they have power. They have strength, but they don't have authority. But God, they still operate underneath God's guidance. He's still in control of them. See, they don't just roam free and kill anything and anything, anybody they want. They first have to get permission. They first have to uh, be allowed to do so. Right? Remember Satan, remember Satan came before the throne of God and asked permission to go against Job. And so we see that. No longer can he go before the throne, but we see now that the, even the demons have to, uh, you know, there has to be an opening for them. You know, it's kind of like, uh, another way I've, I've described it, it's simply this. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you're swimming in the, uh, swimming in the ocean, and, uh, and, and I say this, um, let me rephrase it. Let me see if I can get it better, a little bit better. If, if you're swimming in the ocean, and you're sw swimming in, a, in an area that you know there are no sharks in, Right? Then you have, you're offered a level of protection because you, you know for a fact there are no sharks in the immediate vicinity. Go ahead and cut yourself. Give, create an opening. Hang out and let that, without sealing that opening back up and let the blood kind of... Pretty soon a shark's going to be coming in. Why? Because they sm smell the blood. They smell the fresh wound. They know that there's an opening. And they're drawn to that opening just like demons and lions. So these young lions, they are, if they're under his control and if they're demonic lions, if you will, and they still yet are under the control of God Almighty, what are they doing? Being allowed to do what they do. They're enacting God's judgment in the land of the living. See, the, and the, you're offered no protection if you don't belong to God. No one can protect you. God alone is your rock. God alone is the fortress. He alone is the redeemer, the strong refuge, the high tower. He alone is the fortress upon which you run to. He alone is your redeemer and your savior. So what happens now is the, the young lions are out there and, and they're, they're, they're seeking whom they can devour. And you know what? If you're on their side, they're just as apt to devour you. Sometimes they'll let you go because Satan has a plan for you. But other times they'll, they'll just attack you day in and day out. They torment you with depression. They torment you with fear. They torment you with you know, all, all these other uh, maladies and all these other things in life. With sickness and all these things that God rebukes to the, for those who are blessed by him and are in his auspices. And who belong to his house and who haven't broken that hedge of protection. So these young lions, I'm trying to teach you something, they're allowed to enact the judgment of God in the land of the living. But when the king comes back,
the line of Judah, the king of kings, the great line, if you will, when he returns, even though they enacted judgment temporarily, he's coming back with judgment eternal. So the great lion will come back and he will even destroy all the young lions. They were off doing his bidding because the bidding that they were doing was evil. So he'll allow them, he'll destroy them, and he'll destroy everything that is, uh, pertains to the evil, and he will judge all mankind. So the judgment that they are allowed to participate in right now is temporary, but the judgment that he will render will be eternal. So he still conquers all, because he is the great line of Judah, you see. He came first meek, humble, the servant king, the one who sacrificed himself for all humanity, he returns that roaring lion of Judah whom evil cannot hide from and whom he will devour. The tables will soon be turned. Amen? Amen. Amen. So when we think about Daniel, and you think about this lion's den, I hope you think of this story and you begin to see that just as the king desires to give us a get, desire to give Daniel a kingdom, just as the king intercedes on behalf of, of Daniel and, and, and prayed and fasted on his behalf, just as Daniel went into the lion's den, Christ went into the lion's den, and just as uh, Daniel was saved from the lions and, and the mouths of the lions were shut too, so too will the accuser of the brethren be shut up, and so too will we be protected and we will be saved from the attack of the lions. Amen? So there is a roaring lion who is coming. The king is returning soon. Amen. Amen. As you stand. So now when we reread re those verses, now I hope it makes more sense to you when it says a lion from the desert will slay them because their transgressions are many. Their apostasies are numerous. Because you've not listened